It's exciting. If you haven't been here, we're, we're talking about the king and his kingdom, or we're basically looking at what Jesus said about the kingdom of God in his parables. And uh, I want to thank you all for praying for me and our students and Shannon and Morgan as we took a trip to Dominican over spring break. Uh, really appreciate your blessing. God was fruitful in that trip. And uh, as somebody who's going to have a student in, in the youth ministry here in just a couple months, uh, it was really good to see Shannon in his elements. Uh, my son's in good hands, and so I appreciate him. And thank you all for your prayers. You'll see a little bit more about that this morning as well. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Matthew 25. We're going to be in verses 31 through the end. And while you are turning, let me ask you this question. Do you ever wonder where you're at with God? In other words, are you you okay with Jesus in your life? Right now, is God looking at you going, that's where you need to be. Just keep on keeping on. Or he's like, "Eh, you're kind of below the curve. Well, I do that sometimes in my own life and even... Right now, just where I am, I'm kind of in this season where I've really been praying more than I ever have, uh, and I still ask myself that question, God, am, am, am I where I'm supposed to be right now? Am I okay with you? And, and I think if I'm wrestling with that, I think that there's probably some of you that are wrestling with that as well, and one of the great things about our story this morning is it helps us with that, and one of the great things that that our leadership have done at our church is that we know that we often want to do that. We want to evaluate where are we at with, with God? Are we okay with God? And so we've devised you know, a, a, an easy way to communicate that where we experience God. Are you experiencing God in worship? You're here this morning, so yes. But hopefully you're doing that on your own as well in, in your own room privately. We, we find community. You do that in life groups. And if you don't have a life groups, we'd love to help you find one. Just Go to the connection booth at the back at the end of the service, and we'd love to help you find a community where you can grow together. And it's also making disciples. Are you replicating people uh, with the same faith as you and also then serving others because Jesus was all about serving others? And so, like I said, Matthew 25, it's a parable we're going to look at this morning. And if you haven't been here, uh, Tom introduced the series, and if you want to catch up on that, you can download uh, Tom's message and all of these messages from our website and listen to it as a podcast. But a parable is an everyday story with a point that unlocks a spiritual truth. It forces us to think about ourselves and to think about God, and Jesus gives us one such parable in Matthew 25. So will you stand with me in honoring God's word? Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then skipping to verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And finally, verse 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning, I just pray that you would inspire, awaken, and revive your people through your word. God, just help me to get out of your way so that you can speak clearly to our hearts. This time is yours. Give us ears to hear from you. In your name, amen. Okay, you guys can have a seat. So that's a a crazy scene. I mean, the stakes got high really quick. I mean, it's it's fascinating. It's disturbing. There's there's lakes of fire, and, and people are being compared to livestock. But before I unpack this story this morning, we need to remember where it falls in Scripture. There's no part of Scripture that just stands on its own as just an empty truth. And this is actually a thread of what Jesus is teaching his disciples. And the context of that thread is, will you be ready when Jesus comes back? In Matthew chapter 24 and 25, there, it's, it's a group of teachings that are all about the, the end, the final judgment, and what will happen. And Jesus gave this teaching on the Mount of Olives, and which is why it's sometimes called the Olivet Discourse. But it's also the last teaching that, that Matthew records of Jesus, because it immediately goes from the end of 25 into the events that, that discuss his death 
his burial, and his resurrection. And so the subject is basically warnings of judgment, the end, the final judgment, and the return of Jesus. And we need to be ready because Jesus will come in an hour when no one expects him. And so what he's basically doing is, is illustrating through some parables, what does it mean to be ready? What does it mean to be ready for the return of Jesus? He's got the, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, and now the parable of the sheep and the goats. And all these teach the same things. There will be many who call themselves Christians, many who think that they're ready, and they won't be. When will the return be is another one of the questions that's brought up. And, and the fact is, is that Jesus himself says that he doesn't know, only the Father knows in chapter 24, 36. So just as an aside, if anybody tells you that they know the date and the time of Christ's return, they're not listening to Jesus. Because Jesus said, I don't know the date and the time of my return. Only the Father knows. Your task is to be ready when it happens. And so this morning, I ask you, are you ready? Jesus starts off in our passage today talking about himself as the Son of Man. This is a name that he often gave to himself when he was sharing with his disciples. But there he is in his glory, seated in his glory, surrounded by his angels. And after this very first statement in verse 31, he stops referring to himself as the Son of Man, but it immediately begins referring to himself in the rest of the parable as the king. And that's a king with a capital K. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a distinction there that immediately calls to our mind Revelation 19, where Jesus is given the label and the banner, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's a finality to it. This is the final judgment. He puts the sheep on the right. That's you over here for you guys. I'm doing it backwards for me. The goats on the left. The sheep get the full inheritance. They get to have eternal life. The kingdom prepared for them, and the goats get cursed, thrown into eternal punishment. And so the real question we have to, we have to understand this morning is what's the distinction? What, what causes sheep to be cast over here and goats to be cast over here? And when we look at a parable, we need to understand something. It's that we can't project our own understanding back into the day and times that they were in. In other words, we need to understand what life was like for them because we go into the parable with assumptions about sheep and goats. And just me being me, I did a lot of research about sheep and goats this week, and I found some interesting things. Yeah, what were you doing, right? Um, but if you think about it, on the surface, what's the difference between the two? I mean, they've got four legs, they've got hooves. They bleat, they got horns, they got those really creepy eyes with the rectangle pupils. I mean, it's almost the same animal. What's really the difference? Well, I mean, we give him these names and everything, but one of the things that's, um, that, I, that I was, was looking at was that we, we can kind of in our mind picture what a goat looks like and picture what a sheep looks like, but we've had 2,000 years of selective breeding and, and animal husbandry and all of this to, to kind of draw these animals apart. In, in the Bible times, there was much less distinction between the two animals. There were some behavioral differences, and they would use them for different functions, but it was, they kept them all together. They, they would use, they'd take sheep and goats out into the same pasture, and then they would bring them in tonight, at the night, and, and they would separate them just based on the animal's needs, because goats tended to be more independent, sheep tended to want to be together, but sheep didn't need to be as protected as much from the elements, because their, their wool was thicker, and, and on and on and on and on. Okay, I'm not going to bore you with all that. But most of what I read said that it's, it's, it's hard today to make the distinction between the two. It would have been harder in Jesus' day to make the distinction between the two. And even still today, it's difficult for scientists to classify, is this animal a sheep or a goat? And I'll get more on that later. We'll come back to that. But like I said, shepherds would have had both, and they were used for a variety of purposes, but they would eat them, and more importantly, they would use them in worship. Sheep and goats were used to honor God since the very beginning. I mean, most people think that Abel's sacrifice of animals to God in Genesis 4 was sheep. So, I mean, just they've been there from the beginning. And in Leviticus 16, goats are used. The, the guilt of the nation of Israel was placed upon the goat. It was cast out. It's the scapegoat. And so these animals were very much a part of, of uh, the, their worship of God. And even more to the point, in Jesus' day, sheep and goats would both have 
economic value and they would have moral value, that they would both be considered good because we do have this story and we, we operate under this that we tend to think of, well, if you're going to sh- separate sheep and the goats, the goats are bad because that's just kind of culturally ingrained in us, but they wouldn't have had that back then. So this, wait, why are you sending the goats over there? That would have kind of been a shock to Jesus' hearers. And I think that's what he's going for because he's going for you're not going to be ready. You think you are, and you're not going to be ready. And again, I ask the question, what is the basis of the separation of the two? Well, we can see that in verses 35 through 40. The king says to the sheep on the right, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the least one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You see, the sheep are known by how they love Jesus, by loving Jesus' people the way Jesus loved them. To illustrate this, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to, to see something. Last week, like I said, I got to go on this trip to the DR, and I want you to see some of our students and how they served the king, how they, they, they were filled with God's love, and then they went to share with other people, and then they, in turn, they wanted to come back and encourage you with that. So I'm going to show you uh, just a quick, short video here from people who want to encourage you with their love of Jesus. Like our team did a great job, not only connecting with kids, but being phenomenal at doing the work that was placed in front of us. Uh, we held together good, and uh, to me, uh, that was just a, an amazing takeaway to see our students not only work together, but grow closer to God. I really liked how the kids ran right up to us when we got there. My takeaway from the trip is um, I'm just going to be grateful for everything I have. Seeing the love between each other despite the language barrier. Hey, so my takeaway is that God is so good and wow, Dominican is awesome. But he is so good and only burnt half of my body. Just knowing and realizing that brothers, sisters in Christ worship the same God as me. My biggest takeaway was just coming here and just learning that these churches still keep going and that we have the like, importance of impact and the importance of praying with them even after we're gone. One of the things that I took away from this trip is just like how God can use everybody to work together to make like other people's lives better. And like having the ability to like serve others and that way and like knowing that I'm capable of it because of God it's just an awesome feeling. My highlight was worshiping together with the people in the church and seeing them worship in another language it just made me feel like uh, music transcends language barriers and gave me a glimpse of heaven. Jesus is the way the truth and the life and this is not going to stop me from telling people about Jesus. Hey church family, we had a great week in the DR and I just want to let you know how proud I am of our students, just the way that they uh, served each other and they served the people of the Dominican and how they blessed them with the gospel. They went above and beyond and they really just showed the fact that the church of tomorrow is actually around today, that our students are a part of our church and they're doing the work of the gospel and they're making disciples and they're serving each other. And we're going to have lots of other opportunities for you to go on mission and so I hope that you hear their story, you get excited by it, and you let God take you on an adventure to go and change the world. There's, uh, yeah, you can clap for our students. We should be proud of them. Absolutely. There's There's a selflessness that emerges when we walk with Jesus. And so they just want to illustrate that to you and challenge you to take a step out and to love like Jesus loved. But to the goats on the left, back to our passage. In verse 42, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothing or sick and in prison? And we didn't help you. And he replied, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these... You did not do for me. Just as we're looking at this passage, there's a couple of quick notes here. The fact is the goats address Jesus as Lord. 
does not mean that they are believers, right? Because Philippians chapter 2 tells us, we know this is at the final judgment, that at the final judgment, everyone will confess that Jesus is Lord. And the goats are living a selfish life. They saw lots of people in need, but they didn't do anything for them. The goats had not accepted the love of Christ, and they didn't have his love to give to other people. So on the surface of this parable, it looks like Jesus is telling us that the deciding factor on what separates us, what separates us for our eternal destination is what we do. But here's a spoiler, that's not it. You see, the parable doesn't have any hidden meaning. It's not a riddle that we have to unpack. There's just one main simple truth, and it's the plain, simple meaning of the story. What is the basis of the separation? And that's found in verse 34. Look there with me. Jesus says this, the distinction is you who are blessed by my Father. The determining factor is not what they do, but it's who they are. Let me say that again. The determining factor of their eternal destination is not what they do, it's who they are. And when we, when we understand this, we understand that Jesus is not giving us this all-encompassing view of this is what it's going to be. A parable has a very simple, direct point, and the point is this is an identity issue. The, what defines your identity? Are you in Christ or are you not in Christ? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? Why are the sheep blessed by the Father? And that's important. And I think it's found in 2 Corinthians 5.17 because the sheep have an identity that's found only in Jesus. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. A new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. They're transformed. They're different from the goats. That's the distinction. That's the separation. You who are blessed from my Father. The sheep are blessed by God. And as a result, by being blessed by God, then they are heirs to his kingdom. And guys, the, the Bible is full of connections that the people of God, the followers of God, the disciples of God, that the Bible continually refers to us as his sheep over and over and over and over in Scripture. Psalm 95, 7, he is our God, we are a sheep belonging to his flock. And so we become a hit part of his flock by receiving Christ. John 1, 12, all who receive him, those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Galatians 4, because you are sons of God, he has sent forth his spirit into our hearts, and therefore we are no longer slaves but sons, and if we are sons, then we are an heir. If we are heirs, we are blessed by our Father. And this is how we gain the identity that leads to our inheritance, that leads us to being pushed to the right, to being sheep. Come and take your inheritance is what Jesus tells us, is those who believe in the gospel and have exchanged their life for his life. Christ acknowledges then that the behavior of those that are in Christ is consistent with their identity. That's what he's looking at here. And here's, here's just another way to understand it. This is real important that we get this, guys, that they are not sheep because they serve God. They serve God because they are sheep. And, and here's how I know that, because notice their surprise. Go back and look in the parable. They, they say, when, when did we see you sick or in prison or hungry or thirsty? When did we see these things? They weren't serving others to earn God's favor. They were serving others because that's what sheep do. In verse 35, Jesus said, you gave me something. Having our identity changed and being filled with the life of Christ will have an effect on the way that we live our life. Good deeds alone are not enough to make us an heir, to receive the inheritance of God, but they are a valid way of helping us distinguish between sheep and goats. Leviticus 19, God tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. James 2.26 tells us that faith without works isn't a thing. It's not faith. John 1.4, 1 John 4.19 says, we love others because he first loved us. Jesus told us parable not to imply that we receive salvation by what we do, but to show us that there are many who merely pretend to know God, act like they're supposed to, observe the right rituals, but they never live a life challenged, they'll never live a life changed, and they don't love people the way that he loves them. And so there's great potential for misunderstanding this if we don't view it within the entirety of Jesus' 
Jesus' teachings and of all of Scripture. Because some people use this parable as a way of saying, if I can get to heaven, if I just work good enough, if I'm a good person, if I'm better than people around me. But the gospel clearly teaches that the only way to be made right with God is the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And our belief in him and just over and over again, Romans 5, 8, John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, John 14, 6, G- the only way to get to God is through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In verse 40, the king will say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did to me. Notice in verse 40 how closely Christ associates himself with his brothers and sisters. Because loving each other is the same thing as loving God. It is the greatest commandment. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Guys, that's not a first commandment, second commandment, that's commandment 1A and 1B. Because we can't love God without loving our neighbor, and we can't love our neighbor without loving God. And that's what the sheep understood in this passage. Now notice the goats, Jesus said, you are cursed, you're bound under your own judgment, Depart from me, accursed ones. You're going to the place of punishment for the devil and, the, and his followers. What we need to understand here, guys, is that hell was not made for us. It was made to punish the devil, and man doesn't belong there. But God who loves us, and if we say, God, I don't want to spend this life with you, he's not going to make us spend the next life with him either. And we need to, before we get all bent out of shape about the reality of hell and ignore and like, I don't like that, I don't like the sound of that. Sounds like God's being judgmental or forceful or whatever. We need to be mindful of the great links that God has gone to to make sure that hell is not our destination. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to teach us about who he is in his word. He didn't have to come to earth and die for us. He didn't have to extend out his hand of grace to us continually. But he does because he doesn't want anyone to perish but to have eternal life the goats are bound under this curse and under this judgment because that's the wages of sin the reality is we're all bound under that curse except we've those of us who have received christ in their lives the goats aren't judged for not serving guys that's not the point they're judged because they are selfish because it's their nature and because they they don't see things the way God sees them, they don't love the way that God loves. So this parable is like a mirror. It works like a mirror, and it shows us who we are and helps us examine ourselves in relationship with God. So this morning, is Jesus talking to you? Honestly, deep inside, ask yourself, am I a sheep or am I a goat? This parable is about being ready, about being, experiencing the unexpected end, the final judgment. If Jesus was to return this afternoon, would you be ready? Eternal life and judgment are an issue of identity, not of what you do. Are you a follower of Jesus or are you a pretender? Now remember in the beginning where we're talking about sheep and goats and we're talking about how it was hard for scientists to classify them. Do you guys remember that? Anybody? That was like 10 minutes ago. You know, okay, just get us up to speed. Well, see, here's the thing. It's really tricky. A few years back, I was reading in National Geographic, and it was this whole story about taxonomy, how we classify animals, and all these new discoveries that are being made. And they talked about these tricky areas, like sheep and goats. Like, what is the real difference between them? And because there's not really external markers, because there are, there are goats with lots of wool, and there are, you know, there are sheep that, are, that operate independently. There's all these different types of these animals. So it was it's very, very difficult for them to come up with a clear-cut way of saying this animal's a sheep and this animal's a goat. But they found the easiest way, there was a, actually a really easy way, and it was at the core of who the animal was. Like In other words, like if you looked at this animal and you went inside the DNA, it would tell you, is this a sheep or a goat? Because sheep have 54 chromosomes and goats have 60 chromosomes. And so just... It's not what the, how the animal behaves, it's not what the animal does, it's not what the animal looks like, but it's deep down in its core. It's who it is, that's what, whether it's a sheep or a goat. And one of the great things that they found is they started then testing all these animals, and what they found out is that a mountain goat, you know the big white one that lives way up in the alpines or whatever, mountain goat's a sheep. 
And the, and the bighorn sheep, you know, in the Rockies, they got the, that's on the Dodge Ram, the truck, you know, they got the big curl horn. A bighorn sheep's actually a goat. Are you surprised? Are you surprised? Well, the sheep and the goat were surprised. In, in our story today, they're surprised. When did we see you in need, Jesus? It's not what you do on the outside, but who you are on the inside. Jesus said in Matthew, I'm sorry, in John 5, 24, I say to you, who, who, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Church, are you a sheep? First look this morning. Second, parables show us the heart of God. Compassion, love, service to others, these are God's passions. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. Service is a good indicator of our identity. Has your behavior been consistent with your identity? Guys, yesterday I was real proud of our church because there were like 30 of us who went to a training on a Saturday afternoon to try to go figure out, to get all the training we needed to go to the juvenile detention center and to be able to share Christ with kids that, you want to talk about marginalized and people that society has forgotten. So church, I'm just, I'm proud of you and I'm proud of the dozens of you that serve in our children's building or, or teach our students about Christ or those of you who teach life groups or those that you help out with food pantry and on and on and on, guys. You guys give so much of your time and your effort for the kingdoms. You help out in so many ways. But that may not be you this morning. You may not be compassionate to your neighbor. And you may not have a place to serve others. Well, at the end, in just a few minutes, back at the connection booth, Matt's going to be back there. and he, We've got a catalog of all the places in our church where people can just plug in and start serving in God's kingdom. It's not hard. Look again at what Jesus said. Did he say, I was thirsty, and you sold everything you had and lived in a cardboard box? No. He said, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Did he say, I was a stranger and you moved to another continent away from your family? No, he says, you welcomed me. I was sick and you performed miracles. Uh, I was sick and you performed miracles and you called down all the glory from heaven. No, that's not what he says. He says, I was sick and you visited me. Just simple everyday things that honestly don't take a lot of effort, but just diligence and willingness to do it. You don't have to be wealthy to provide a meal for someone. And you don't need to be a doctor to, heal, to, to take care of somebody who's sick. Extending this kind of neighborly love is, with any, is within any of our abilities. And they don't necessarily have to fit in these little categories, these six little areas that Jesus was talking about. You can be neighborly and share the love of Christ by helping someone change a flat tire or jump their dead battery or on and on and on. Because, guys, the reality is the, the potential for compassion is limitless because human needs are limitless. But this is the important thing. What Jesus will say to you then at the final judgment depends on what you do now. And so you need to make a decision. What are you going to do with the eternal life that he's, done, that he's given you? If you need a place, Matt's going to be back there. Find your place to serve. And the last challenge I want to say this morning, and then, and then we'll pray and we'll respond, is that what if you could say, I don't, I don't do these things, I don't know. I don't know that I'm ready. I don't know that what Jesus would say to me at the end, if I would be a sheep or a goat. Well, I would say come and talk to one of us. Come to talk to Tom or Matt or Gail or Stu, Shannon, Jacob. We'd all love to help you find your place, to nail it down, to be sure. Because this parable makes it clear that there's an eternal destination for all of us. Guys, we were made in God's image, and one of the things that that means is that means that we were meant to be in relationship with God forever. But our sin cost us something. It cost us that relationship because in the Bible it teaches us that when we rebelled against God, it gave us the wage of death. And that death is layered. It's not just a physical death, but it's a spiritual death, which is a separation from God which means that we don't know God's mind, we don't know his heart, we're confused about God, or maybe we're fearful from him, or maybe we're running from him, and we can't call out to him and say, God, can you guide me, can you help me? And it also means an eternal death, and that's the lake of fire, the, the eternal separation from God that we were never meant to be in, it was never meant for us. 
But today you can know for sure. And I love this verse in John because John says basically, I write these things down here. I wrote the gospel of John so that you would know this, so that you would continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have the life by the power of his name. Romans 10, 9 says, Declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved.